company that make this camera, Blackmagic Design, are actually um, a company that started up in Melbourne. Uh, they're all over the world now. They're a very big company, but uh, they're in post. And uh, if you've done any editing, you've probably come across their products. They make video capture cards, they make monitors, they make converters, and all this kind of post-production stuff. Um, a couple of years ago, they bought uh, a company called DaVinci. Um, and to a cinematographer, uh, a very well-known name because um, whenever I was uh, grading and going in and finishing the, the films or uh, TV shows I was working on, you went and saw a colorist at a big fancy facility and it looked like somebody had a Star Trek and they were always grading on this Da Vinci panel. And that was kind of the, I guess, the video equivalent of Photoshop. Uh, but it could do a lot of things in real time. It was very fast to work and that was the kind of standard tool. Uh, but it was like half a million bucks at least to set one of these up. So the, a couple of years ago, Blackmagic bought this company, Da Vinci, um, and uh, they decided to make the software-only version, uh, make a software-only version of that available for only a thousand bucks, which is a huge price difference. Suddenly, it was really affordable. Uh, and the only difference between that software and what you would used to pay literally $1,500 an hour to go and use at a facility was that they had this big kind of control panel that makes it a bit faster. But functionally, what the software is doing is exactly the same. And you guys, if you're interested in any kind of image making, you should go to the website because they actually give you a very fully featured sort of a light version for free. So you can go and download the light version of DaVinci and you get single node grading. I don't think it does keying or shapes and some noise reductions to some of the very advanced features, but it's still a really amazing kind of color correction tool and you can download it for free and you can you know process your if you're shooting on the cannons and so on you'll actually get you know pretty good results if you take the time to get to know it because this is the very first camera they made it's a like you know the, the original prototype uh, and so when you look at the manuals you'll see it's, I haven't they haven't updated it or rebuilt it because they, they you know every few weeks they'd sort of send me another one so these are all still hand built so they're not assembled in a factory yet because they're still kind of um, tinkering with the boards and the components and those kind of things. So um, uh, these two are both hand-built prototypes, but this one is the original Mark I, so to speak. That uh, I mean, they had uh, uh, like another one that they were testing in the laboratory there, but this is the first one that kind of went out and actually shot some stuff with. So I hand this around for you in a little while, and you can have a little play. Uh, and I started shooting some stuff on Puberty Blues with it, and uh, it was a very sort of fast learning curve, and we're sort of up to the point now where uh, I'd say within the next couple of weeks, you'd, you'd expect that they would start shipping these cameras out. So, uh, is anyone actually thinking of buying one or even maybe ordered one? Look at that, it's a few hands. Okay. How, sorry? Uh, they sell them for three grand, and for that, you get the, you get the $1,000 DaVinci software. So, uh, not that I'm here to sort of sell a camera, but, um, uh, you know, basically, you're paying, in effect, $2,000 for, for a camera that in many ways, which I'll talk about in a second, kind of exceeds a lot of the other cameras that are out there in terms of the DSLRs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty amazing camera. I, I'll, I'll try not to get too techy, but if you want to, I can. Um, why it's amazing is because, um, well, it's, it's cheap for what it does. It's really good value. Now, it's not quite as good as some of the bigger uh, production cameras that we use, like uh, the Alexa or the uh, Reds, but it does probably 90% of the job uh, for a fraction of the cost. And so for someone like me where, in a way, not that money is no object, but you know, on Puberty Blues I had three Alexas, two C300s, and two of these, and an Epic, so I had you know, pretty much one of everything or a few of everything. The cost is not so much an issue. It's more about the convenience of what I need to do the job to get the job done quickly because you know, time is very expensive on a film set. Um, so for me, you know, the cost is not the kind of cool thing. What's cool is that it's small and compact and it gives me a kind of great result. So we had been using um, you know, 5Ds and 7Ds and GH2s and I used actually on season two, we had a hacked GH1 and the AF100s. So we've been using these kind of smaller cameras a lot for you know, when you're shooting in a car nowadays, uh, it's very restrictive with um, what you're allowed to do from a legal point of view. Um, I think I was just coming in at the era where it was okay to hang out of a door with a seatbelt you know, around your waist, um, but uh, you're not really allowed to do that anymore. So nowadays you're very restricted and we have to, you know, if you look at a full size built Alexa or, a, or even a Red, they're quite big and there's no way you're gonna get in the back of a car and start shooting with it. So something as small as this is great. And also too, for more, intimate scenes if you're with the cast and you want to kind of create, uh, I guess, a, a more intimate environment. Um, on a big show like Puberty Blues, there's like 30 or 40 people on set, you know, and we had two uh, young lead cast 
One of them in particular hadn't really done a lot. They were kind of inexperienced and sometimes you just want to get the machinery out of the way and kick everyone out of the room. So it was just me and the director and a boom swinger and, and I'm holding this and you know you can, you can get very quick and very fast kind of results by shooting in that way rather than sort of setting up a tripod and putting marks down and rehearsing stuff and all of that other palaver. So these smaller cameras give you that kind of option. Um, but unlike a 5D, they, you know, the thing is with 5Ds, they're, they're kind of a stills camera, a fantastic stills camera uh, that happened to shoot video. And really their kind of success as a camera to shoot video, and I'm sure probably half the audience here, you've all got 5Ds, right, haven't you? Who's got a 5D? Oh, there's a few, a 7D. Anyone shooting video on DSLRs, yeah. Panasonic's and stuff? Yeah, there's a few. So the reason you know they're so successful I and mean, they, they do look good, but it was kind of accidental. Um, they, I, you know, Canon actually have a video camera division, uh, and here was the photo division outselling the video division with a with a stills camera. So more people were buying cameras from a different division of Canon than what they were supposed to. So you know you had this kind of uh, great successful product, and a lot of people liked it because of the look. You know it gave you a, a very uh, unique look because it was a full frame or a one three five size sensor. So the depth of field was very shallow. A lot of people found it very filmic, and it was also really small and very cheap. You know the camera didn't cost anything. The lenses were relatively inexpensive as well, and so when. Um, Blackmagic came to design to decide to build this. They kind of said, okay, like let's look at everything that we don't like about a 5D, that it's highly compressed, that it's only 8 bit of data, um, and, uh, and like let's make a better version of that. So what they did was they made an uncompressed 12 bit camera. So it's not every, every jump in 2 bit is like a kind of quantum leap. So, you know, a lot of your Alexas and those things are 10 bit cameras. This is a 12 bit RAW or 10 bit ProRes camera. So it gives the option to kind of record in a few different types of codecs that aren't sort of um, arbitrarily throwing a lot of your data away. So you kind of get everything. Now, the downside of that is it uses a Lot of, uh, a lot of space on your disk. So, you know, you've probably got used to 16 or 32 gig cards in your cameras. So when I put a drive in this, these little uh, SSDs that pop in the side here, like this one. So that's a 240 gig SSD. So probably half of you've got your laptop with a drive that big. That'll hold about half an hour, only 30 minutes of raw footage. Okay, so it takes up a lot of space. And then you've got to offload that and it takes quite a long time. Anyone tried to copy 200 gig of files? It doesn't happen in five minutes, I can tell you. So um, you have to have somewhere to back up that footage. You've got to have uh, quite a bit of hard drive storage. So even though the camera's quite cheap, I guess if you're thinking of buying it for those that have ordered it, just plan on buying a lot of hard drives to store all of this stuff. But the good news is, is that, you know, um, it, it, it gives you a kind of, a, 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 I guess, a quantum leap in terms of picture quality, in, in terms of what you can do with the image and the great ability of the image. So um, what I might do now is uh, just trying to work out where we can go next. I might actually show you some footage. While I do that, I'm going to hand this camera around. I'm very attached to this camera, so <laughs> please don't break it. Um, it does have a 90 minute or so battery, so hopefully there's a bit of charge in there. So um, you can just turn it on here with this button here, and it'll turn on within a couple of seconds. There's no disc or anything in there, so it won't, uh, won't record at the moment. And in fact, uh, there you go. So there's a menu. If you hit this menu here, there's some different screens. You can have a look and play with some of those settings. If you want to, and just hit the menu to go back. And of course, as you zoom or focus, you'll be able to have a look there, okay? So the question is, why uh, did they not make a sensor size that matched, say, a 5D, which is a, a very large size, or the more common size in motion picture, which is Super 35, um, which has a, is sort of is halfway between this and a 5D? The reason they did that was cost. So to get a Super 35 or even a full frame sensor uh, they'd never get it to that price. It would be a much more expensive camera and they wanted to hit that $3,000 price point and so this sensor gave them a huge amount of dynamic range. It looks fantastic in terms of the colours uh, and it's somewhere between Super 16 and, and Super 35. So from a motion imaging point of view, there's 100 years of history of working with that sensor size. I think a lot of people that kind of um, uh, really dig that, I mean, you know, I've I'm guilty of it as well. I've shot with full frame cameras and it looks great, but that size sensor is only, has only been around for the last five years for us that shoot motion pictures. And it's great to have that option, but it's, you know, there's a long history of cinema where we've, we, we got along fine and we made things look cinematic without needing to resort to a really yeah. big sensor size. So they really want to hit their price. I mean, they might do something in the next few years, you know, you never know. It's really just about cost, so. So I just want to show you this clip. This is um, 
This is shot with a very early prototype, or basically the one you've got in your hands there that's going around now. So uh, what we wanted to do is, uh, I guess, uh, decide, have a look at the dynamic range. So what is the kind of brightness range that this camera can handle? One thing that we're always kind of dealing with when we go into locations, especially if you're not in a studio, is you're looking at windows like that where you, know, you can sort of see uh, sunlight shining outside, and a lot of cameras can't cope with that extreme of contrast. You can choose to see outside the window, or you can choose to see inside the window, but it's very hard to handle kind of both. And dynamic range, or increasing that dynamic range, means we don't have to kind of fight that uh, as much. So we sort of set up this little scenario in this uh, house here. So I'll just play you this clip now. So does anyone pick the, which, which camera that is, if it's a, a 5D or the uh, Blackmagic? 5D. Why did you think that? <laughs> okay, so th um, this is a really interesting shot. So basically, we had Leah, who's uh, um, a young actor who I've worked with a bit on. Um, you probably remember her from the first season of uh, Offspring, and I think she's in House Husbands coming up as well. Um, so a scene like that, you know, where you've got uh, clipping here, like see how you've got the color there, but as soon as the sun hits it, it just turns white. You've lost the detail there. You can't really see out the window. It's gone a bit thermonuclear. Um, but, you know, we're still holding her inside. Um, I haven't really graded this. So this is from the Blackmagic camera, and you'll see straight away when you get to this corner there, all of a sudden now you can see out the window, and you've got uh, detail here in the highlights. It still feels like it's lit by the sun, but now you can actually see what's going on out there. Sorry? Oh, like I did one take, flipped the camera, put the next one on, like, oh, within a minute. Yeah. And just got her to repeat the action. So I'll just show you that again. Let's just. Then the next thing you're going to see here is an ungraded, like this is how the shot comes out of the black magic. So it's actually very flat. You can see the, the blacks are really milky uh, and it doesn't have a lot of contrast in there. And the, the reason that is is because uh, it, it's, got a, it's basically capturing a lot more. So you have to kind of grade it to get the most out of it. So here's my grade uh, of that same shot. And this is the, the black magic shot where you can see out the window and you can see the detail there. So there's a, like a comparison really between the two. And also you'll notice there's a little difference in the frame size and that's the crop factor that we were just talking about before, the difference in sensor size. But in terms of depth of field, uh, it doesn't make a lot of difference really. Like maybe that chair is a bit more out of focus there than what it is there. Uh, but really what I get excited about as an image maker is that I can bloody see out the windows. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I've got the highlights there. So these, what I'm playing back now are actually graded, but they're, they're not compressed. They're um, uh, ProRes QuickTime. So you know each one of these is a couple of hundred meg. Uh, and you can see, I don't know, who, who was it was moaning about the skin tones before? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? So um, this was a, a little shoot that I organized. Um, and in fact, I'm going to reprise this uh, probably tomorrow and we'll shoot, shoot a little bit more, uh, some demo footage. But again, really lovely skin tone, very nice fine detail. And I think on a 5D, you, it wouldn't be as sharp, basically. It'd be a much sort of softer looking image um, in here as well. So I'll play you this one. And again, holding that kind of, actually I'll show you another clip where we get some uh, highlights in the background. This one's a bit warmer. In fact, it's overall a bit too warm. And then again, a good example there of, you know, a lot of people are kind of worry about the lack of depth of field or being able to use focus as a kind of creative tool. Obviously, she's totally soft there and, and we've got the ball sharp as well. So um, we can sort of rack backwards and forwards as well. So um, a shot like this is um, normally really difficult to, to manage because, again, you're pointing out the windows. Over here, it's actually sunlight hitting the uh, walls. And again, to see outside the windows and yet still sort of see in the shadow areas like in through under the table and up in through there is, is pretty remarkable. Like, you'd never get that really unless you're shooting on a, an Alexa or, um, or a, you know, a much more high-end camera. Again, look at the sun right across the window there and, you know, it's holding all that detail. There's also that light globe that's up in the top left uh, corner there. Can you see that? Yeah. Bare bulb. So again, something like that, you, you know, it, it's quite amazing that it's sort of holding onto a lot of that detail there as well. Um, I think we've, s oh, this is a, another, another shot there. And the lighting in here is very simple. I just had a, a Kino, which I think you guys have probably got, a little diva that was sort of behind there and I was just sort of turning on the prax. But even something like that lampshade up the top there, See here you can see the actual globe in the shade? Now on a 5D, that would just be the whole shade glowing, not the globe inside the shade. So you've got that detail of, of kind of very fine um, uh, highlight kind of handling and, and roll off up the top there as well. So uh, it, uh, it works really well.